Good evening and welcome. I'm so glad to see everyone here. I'm really delighted that we are able to bring the Wednesday Night Lectures back, be back in the Great Hall together. Our lecturer tonight is Mr. Steve Steinbach. Mr. Steinbach holds an MA from the Graduate Institute, and currently he's on the faculty of the Sidwell Friends School in Washington, D.C., where he teaches U.S. history and American government. He's a three-time recipient of the U.S. Presidential Scholars Distinguished Teacher Recognition Award, and has recently published a book with Liberty and Justice for All, The Constitution in the Classroom, which has just come out with Oxford University Press. Before turning to teaching, Mr. Steinbach, who also holds degrees from Harvard College and Yale Law School, was a partner at the DC law firm of Williams and Connolly, where he um, specialized in both criminal and civil litigation. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Steinbach. Thank you, Emily. Thank you uh, to Steve Crockett, one of my um, uh, tutors here uh, when I was at St. John's. Um, thank you all for, for, for coming tonight. I'm uh, honored and very nostalgic uh, to be here um, this evening. I spent four very happy summers uh, here at St. John's, uh, driving back and forth um, from home in Washington, abandoning <laughs> my wife and children in the process, but loving every minute here of immersing myself uh, in reading uh, and discussing uh, the books uh, we covered together in, in, in classes. In fact, in my time at St. John's, um, during seminars and preceptorials, uh, gave me uh, the opportunity to explore some texts uh, in detail of special interest to me, particularly a preceptorial I took uh, where we read all of the Federalist Papers together. So I'm so grateful for all of my wonderful teachers at St. John's and for all of our memorable classroom discussions. In my remarks tonight, I'd like to do two things. First, I'm briefly going to focus on the Constitution itself. Uh, I'm a little nervous about doing this because there were a couple of people toward the back of the room who actually brought the Constitution with them, <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll see. The central question uh, I'm going to frame uh, is, is whether the Constitution qualifies as a great book. Uh, belonging to the canon uh, that we read here at St. John's. And then I'm going to offer two examples of teaching the Constitution to illustrate the document's central importance both in our classrooms and hopefully in our larger civic discourse. My intellectual interests in the Constitution actually date back to college where I first studied American political philosophy, where I first read the records of the Philadelphia Convention of 1787 and the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Essays. Eventually, as Emily said, I ended up practicing as a lawyer for many years. But after 25 years of doing that, I uh, switched career paths and became a high school history teacher. And in fact, it was as a newish teacher that I attended the Graduate Institute here at St. John's. Throughout my years as a teacher, I've tried to integrate the Constitution into my classes. One can teach, um, there might be teachers out here, one can teach United States history through a variety of different lenses, uh, social history, economic history, political history, military history, maybe ideally some combination of all of that. But over time, I've become convinced that an essential and underappreciated part of our national story involves debates about the Constitution itself, what the text says, what the words mean, who gets included in the phrase, we the people, or not, what rights get included within the phrase, the blessings of liberty, or not. And that brings me to the first question I'd like to explore, and that's whether the Constitution qualifies as a particular St. John's type great book. If one asks the proverbial person on the street or in academia to name the greatest books in American history, uh, only a few brave souls might mention the Constitution in the same breath as Moby Dick uh, or the great Gatsby or the Invisible Man. Uh, after, our, after all, our Constitution certainly isn't a work of fiction. Uh, it's not anywhere close to a non-fictional work of history. It's nowhere close to poetry. Um, and nor is the Constitution a formal philosophical argument. It's, it doesn't tell us how to run our commonwealth. Uh, 
unlike maybe, you know, Locke's second treatise or Hobbes' Leviathan or Rousseau's social contract, the Constitution doesn't begin to address deeper questions about how we should live or the nature of good and evil. And indeed, any core values that you can tease out of the Constitution aren't obvious, aren't universally accepted, and sometimes swing wildly back and forth over time. So I suppose one could try to classify the Constitution as nothing more than a legal document, um, a mere set of rules and regulations, or a contract, uh, or perhaps even a glorified will uh, that's been left to us by our ancestors and prevents us from doing what we want to do with the estate we inherited. And thinking even more disrespectfully, you could say the Constitution is simply a procedural manual, a cookbook. It tells us how to make laws, it tells us who's in charge, it doesn't tell us what laws to make, or what policies to pursue. Or there are people who swing to completely the opposite side and consider the Constitution almost akin to some sort of sacred writ or holy scripture, in part because it contains lots of commandments, lots of do's and don'ts, in part because at least some people, I'm not part of this crowd, believe it to have been divinely inspired. But also because if you think about it, we keep this document in a secular temple, the National Archives, um, it's a dark and vaulted cathedral-like shrine where pilgrims pay homage to the text. Uh, the analogy breaks down because unlike the Ten Commandments, you know, we can't amend the Ten Commandments with uh, two-thirds of the house and three-fourths of, of, of the state. Okay, enough belaboring of, of, of this point. At the risk of oversimplifying, let me suggest that if the Constitution is going to qualify as a book, then we should embrace it as a great storybook a storybook in which we can read collectively the story of our past. So here's the claim I'd like to advance tonight. The Constitution, considered as a book through its text, through its structure, and through its spirit, enfolds, embraces, and reveals our collective heritage. Or to put it a little more simply, United States history is constitutional history. And let me justify that claim by working backwards. Nowadays, we can easily recognize that the Constitution is front and center in our contemporary debates. Increasingly, Americans have turned to the courts and to the Constitution to debate and resolve their political, social, ideological disagreements. Constitutional theory has become a central part of American life. The national political agenda is laser focused on what the Constitution says, means, includes, or excludes. Bitter judicial confirmation battles attest to that reality, as to the, the fact that virtually everything in our society has become constitutionalized one way or another. Abortion, college admissions, gun possession, real estate development, immigration policies. The justices of the Supreme Court have become household names. They adjudicate and spotlight glare of the front pages of the newspapers and the home pages of our websites. Whether all of that is, is, is good or not is subject to debate. But what I'd like to suggest is that none of that, none of this is new. Throughout our country's history, the Constitution has frequently been front and center in our national disagreements. That is to say, our political controversies have frequently been grounded in and shaped by constitutional fights, or what I would refer to as constitutional moments. And that's the premise of the book project that, that, that uh, Emily referred to. It's titled With Liberty and Justice for All, question mark, because I think it's always been and continues to be an open question. The book features contributions from several constitutional scholars and a foreword from uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The book argues that US history has been shaped by dozens of controversial controversies, so-called constitutional moments. And if you stop and think about it, you don't have to know a, a, a ton of American history to realize that so many such controversies come to mind. When we're in the Philadelphia Convention debating what the structure of government could be, there are disagreements over the power of the new government, the structure of the new government, the role of the states in the new regime, what should be done, if anything, or not about slavery, whether or not there should be a Bill of Rights. 
And then once the government's up and running brand new, it's not like the constitutional controversies have gone away. If anything, they're multiplied. Early on in our first years, we're disagreeing over the Constitution and whether we can do things like have a national bank or whether the president has the authority to declare neutrality in foreign policy or whether it's constitutional to swallow the Louisiana Purchase. And then comes more controversy over judicial review, the power of the courts to declare laws unconstitutional announced by the Supreme Court in 1803. And there follow additional constitutional controversies over the tariff and whether states could nullify national laws over the admission by Congress of Texas to the Union. And then the decades before and during the Civil War are really one vast constitutional seminar where we're discussing what the Constitution means in the context of the Fugitive Slave Act or the Dred Scott decision or the legitimacy of Southern secession or how one can put down a domestic insurrection and then ultimately and especially how to abolish slavery. And after the Civil War, the constitutional controversies continue. We've added to the Constitution the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. What do they mean? What does the Supreme Court in a series of cases that sort of retrench on those three amendments, what does that the language mean according to the court in those years? And the list goes on. The Chinese Exclusion Act, um, free speech during World War I, eugenics, uh, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, McCarthyism, um, battles to end segregation and enshrine voting rights. In every one of those historical episodes, the Constitution was front and center. In every one of those episodes, we were fighting over who's to be included or not among we the people. And we were fighting over which rights were to be included or not among the blessings of liberty. In other words, to repeat myself, United States history in so many ways is constitutional history. So by way of example, for the balance of, of my remarks, I'd like to focus on, on, on two such constitutional moments among many. The first goes all the way back to the 1790s uh, when Congress passes something called the Sedition Act. Here's the central question this 200 year, 220 year old episode still raises. When we vehemently disagree with each other, how can we keep the peace? When we vehemently disagree with each other politically, how can we keep the peace in this country? We live in partisan and polarized times, but arguably political animosities were even more intense during the 1790s. The country was bitterly divided during the presidency of John Adams, Federalists, including John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, and Republicans like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, had starkly different views over domestic issues such as the national debt, the national bank, the whiskey rebellion. And the parties became further polarized over the excesses of the French Revolution. And then over United States foreign policy when in 1798, we ended up actually going to war with, with France. So in the midst of all of this swirling political animosity, Congress passes a new law restricting aliens and another new law, the draconian sedition statute. The Sedition Act of 1798 criminalized certain speech, specifically any speech that defamed or brought into disrepute the country's president or Congress or their policies. In other words, it now became a federal crime punishable by jail time to criticize the federal government's leaders or its policies. Republicans like Jefferson and Madison charged that the Sedition Act would gravely interfere, you could probably finish the sentence, with fundamental constitutional rights, the rights of all Americans to express their political views through speech, petition, protest, through a free and independent press, rights nominally, supposedly on paper, guaranteed by the First Amendment. Federalists responded that the preservation of liberty required substantial restraints on the public and the press, lest the United States succumb to the same hysteria that had swept through and produced the French Revolution. President Adams and his administration vigorously enforced the Sedition Act, bringing criminal prosecutions against more than two dozen 
prominent Republican newspaper men and even members of Congress. For example, Matthew Lyon, a sitting Republican member of Congress from Vermont, was indicted, convicted, and jailed. He almost died in jail for making so-called seditious statements that consisted of what, you know, if you read it now, you'd say this is ordinary political rhetoric. Um, similar newspaper men were prosecuted for similar publications. And many Americans feared that the new nation, which had just celebrated its 10th birthday, was plunging into tyranny. Recourse to the courts, that's what we do nowadays, we run to a federal court. No one did that back then. That became the norm only in the middle of the 20th century. So given the precarious political situation and lacking other acceptable alternatives, Jefferson and Madison resorted to turning the Constitution on its head. They urged Americans to look for protections for their liberties to state governments, not the national government. Writing in what became known eventually as the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, Jefferson and Madison argued, and think about how this would play out if it were still accepted nowadays, they argued that each state possessed an inherent right, an inherent power to resist or to interpose against illegitimate acts of Congress, according to that state. In other words, states had the right to ignore or even nullify unconstitutional national laws. So often now, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions are cited and condemned as dangerous precedents for things like states' rights and eventually Southern secession. But viewed in the context of their times, Jefferson and Madison were defending liberty against tyranny. They were using and reinterpreting the Constitution to protect bedrock fundamentals, free speech, free press, free elections. Now, eventually, the Federalists got booted from power by the voters. Jefferson was elected in 1800, and we experienced our first peaceful transfer of power. And then Jefferson gave his inaugural address, and he refers directly to the Sedition Act controversy um, with his ringing endorsement of political toleration. Maybe some of you recall this from Jefferson's first inaugural. All will bear in mind this sacred principle that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable. That the minority possesses equal rights, which equal law must protect, and to violate which would be oppression. Every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have been called by different names, but we're brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists, says Jefferson. The Sedition Act expired. Jefferson granted pardons to everyone. In fact, 40 years later, Congress even refunded all the fines that had been assessed. But lest you can conclude that this is a story with a happy ending, think again. Jefferson's president, a few years into his administration, he's upset, to say the least, because the Supreme Court is ruling against him consistently. And as it turns out, Jefferson pursues the one and as so far only attempt in our nation's history to impeach and remove a justice of the Supreme Court. He objects to some of the decisions and actions of Justice Samuel Chase, an ardent Federalist. And so Jefferson wants to remove him from the court. And Jefferson says that Chase should be removed because of his quote, seditious attacks on the principles of our constitution, which should not go unpunished, unquote. Soon enough, upon Jefferson's urging, the House votes to impeach Justice Chase. He puts it's put on trial in the Senate. He barely survives, but only because some of Jefferson's fellow Republicans defect, falls a few votes short, and inadvertently establishes an important principle we've lived with ever since, that federal judges are removed from office only for misbehavior and not because we don't like what they decide. So what lessons can we learn now today from the Sedition Act controversy that's more than two centuries old? Um, or to be, repeat sort of my opening question, um, when we vehemently disagree with each other, how can we keep the peace? So here's some thoughts. An initial thought, when we anxiously bemoan our current political tensions, our divisions and animosities between red and blue, perhaps it's somewhat comforting to reflect that we've been there before and somehow have gotten through it. 
Uh, and indeed, many historians think the 1790s were far more dangerous politically um, than what we're presently experiencing. A second thought, the Sedition Act crisis forces us to acknowledge, as James Madison wrote in Federalist 48, that in the end, constitutional rights and protections are at bottom, quote, parchment barriers. They're paper tigers. They're written down, but they mean nothing if we don't live up to them. In the end, all constitutional ideas, free speech, free press, free debate, free elections, they're only as good as our collective actions as a people in living up to those ideas. Third, the Sedition Act controversy compels us to recognize in retrospect, but gosh, even today, how small the gap can be between tolerating versus imprisoning our political adversaries. In an imperfect political world, we must strive to view our political adversaries as good faith opponents and not enemies. A fourth thought, the Sedition Act controversy teaches that at least sometimes escape valves can be found in creative constitutionalism with no other salvation in sight to protect inestimable constitutional liberties, Jefferson and Madison attempted to stake out a new approach to federalism, seeking refuge in the states. Fifth, the Sedition Act controversy highlights also how easy it is to stray from our constitutional values and principles when it's our own political ox being gored. And now I'm thinking of Jefferson. It didn't take long for him to abandon the soaring rhetoric of his inauguration and to accuse a sitting Supreme Court justice of, quote, sedition that very word that he campaigned against. A final observation, the constitutional crisis of the 1790s might cause us to question the extent to which we the people truly ever learn from history. After the United States entered World War I, President Woodrow Wilson and Congress enacted, yes, another Sedition Act. The Sedition Act of 1918 was much broader than the Sedition Act of 1798. They had learned some lessons. This made it a crime to speak or print anything disloyal or abusive about not only the president, but also the war effort and anything abusive about the Constitution or our nation's form of government or our flag or even the military uniform. And more than 2,000 Americans were prosecuted under the law. A thousand of them were jailed, including most famously Eugene Debs. And there have been other threats to the nation's commitment to civil liberties, such as the internment of Japanese Americans, McCarthyism, the aftermath of 9-11. In 1964, in a landmark decision, the Supreme Court, looking back at the Sedition Act of 1798, declared that it had been effectively repealed in the court of history. But, you know, sometimes one wonders. Let me shift to the other constitutional moment I've chosen to discuss, and that's the aftermath of the Supreme Court's infamous decision in 1857 of Dred Scott versus Sanford. And at the outset, I need to note that what I'm about to say, I've been thinking and writing about for more than a decade. Um, so what I'm about to say was not intended and is not intended to be a commentary on any recent Supreme Court decisions. But I think you'll recognize some echoes um, from the past uh, in today's um, debates, underscoring my overall point that really there's nothing much new under the constitutional sun and that there is much we can learn from constitutional history. So to begin with a, a bit, bit of quick background um, about the Dred Scott case. Dred Scott, an enslaved laborer from Missouri, was taken by his owner to live for brief periods of time in the free state of Illinois and then the free territory of Wisconsin. And he subsequently went to court and sued for his freedom. The Supreme Court ruled that Scott had no right to litigate to be in the court in the first place because he was not a citizen. And he was not a citizen and could never hope to become a citizen because he was not white. The soaring words of the Declaration, all men created equal, did not apply, said the court, to quote the enslaved African race. So too, Negroes, the court's word, were not included among we the people in the Constitution. Instead, Dred Scott and others, and I'm quoting here from the majority opinion, 
were beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. As if this weren't enough, the court then proceeded to declare any efforts by Congress to try to restrict the spread of slavery, such as the Missouri Compromise of 1820, to be unconstitutional. Chief Justice Roger Taney wrote the seven to two opinion. I remember when I was a decade ago here at St. John's, uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney had a big prominent statue on the, uh, the Annapolis uh, State, State House grounds a couple blocks from here that's subsequently been removed. He was hoping to settle definitively slavery questions that had roiled the nation. Uh, and in fact, the court did nothing of the sort, instead accelerated the approaching crisis. Many Southerners at the time, focus on reaction to the opinion, many Southerners at the time celebrated, of course, enthusiastically. They embraced the Dred Scott ruling. The court had vindicated their views as to the legitimacy of slavery under the Constitution. A prominent Richmond newspaper referred to the Supreme Court as an august body, a tribunal of jurists as learned, impartial, unprejudiced as perhaps the world has ever seen, etc. Jefferson Davis praised the elaborate and exhaustive opinion written by Tawney, a man eminent as a lawyer, great as a statesman, and stainless in his moral reputation. And even some Northerners, led by Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas, insisted that the Dred Scott ruling had settled all slavery questions and must be obeyed. Here's Stephen A. Douglas, remember him from the Lincoln-Douglas debates. When I was a lawyer, said Douglas, I appealed until I got to the Supreme Court. And then if that court, the highest tribunal in the world, decided against me, I was satisfied. Because it's the duty of every law-abiding man to obey the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States created the Supreme Court for the purpose of deciding all disputed questions touching the true construction of that instrument, and when such decisions are pronounced, they are the law of the land binding on every good citizen. Well, what about those who believed that the Dred Scott decision was fundamentally wrong, even abhorrent, given that the Supreme Court is the final authority in our constitutional system, at least according to Stephen A. Douglas, what now? Short of outright disobedience or violence or rebellion, what could be done? So abolitionist Frederick Douglass outlined one possible response. My hopes were never brighter than now, said Douglass in the wake of the Dred Scott decision. My hopes were never brighter than now. Douglass put his faith first and foremost, not with the Supreme Court, but with the Supreme Being. Here's what he said. The Supreme Court of the United States is not the only power in this world. It is very great, but the Supreme Court of the Almighty is greater. Judge Taney can do many things, but he cannot perform impossibilities. He cannot bail out the ocean, annihilate the firm old earth, or pluck the silvery star of liberty from the northern sky. Happily for the whole human family, their rights have been defined, declared, and decided in a court higher than the Supreme Court. Douglas went beyond that, though. He also appealed to the ultimate decency of the American people in living up to the language and the spirit of the Constitution. So he added the following. Slavery is doomed to cease. Remember, he wrote this in the immediate weeks after the Dred Scott decision. Slavery is doomed to cease, and liberty is destined to become the settled law of this republic. I base my sense of the certain overthrow of slavery upon the nature of the American government, the Constitution, and the character of the American people. All I ask of the American people is that they live up to the Constitution, adopt its principles, imbibe its spirit, and enforce its provisions. When this is done, the wounds of my bleeding people will be healed. Thus, Frederick Douglass provides one possible response to what he views as an unacceptable Supreme Court decision. Time heals all constitutional wounds. Eventually, to borrow's Lincoln phrase, the better angels of our natures are certain to prevail. 
I, w I wonder how comforting that answer was back in 1857. So I want to explore one alternative approach that was offered at the time, what might be called constitutional resistance or constitutional disobedience. And here we turn of all people to Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was a lawyer and therefore by definition was pledged to uphold the rule of law. In one of the earliest speeches that we know he gave, shortly after an angry mob had murdered Elijah Lovejoy, an abolitionist, Lincoln had assisted, insisted on law abidingness as a response, what he called our political religion. He had urged a reverence for the Constitution and laws as opposed to violent reactions. So the Dred Scott decision must have posed a tremendous constitutional, and I would suggest even psychological crisis for Lincoln. What to do about this Supreme Court decision? Now Lincoln rejected direct violence and disobedience. Quote, we do not propose that when Dred Scott has been decided to be a slave by the court that we as a mob will decide him to be free. The Supreme Court was entitled to respect for its constitutional pronouncements, said Lincoln. Yet in a major speech, pondering the decision and its ramifications, Lincoln offered no fewer than five lines of argument aimed at undermining the legitimacy of the Dred Scott decision. First, Lincoln expressed the hope that the decision someday, somehow, would be overturned. Here's what he said. We think Supreme Court decisions on constitutional questions, when fully settled, should control not only the particular cases decided, but the general policy of the country. But we think that the Dred Scott decision is erroneous. We know the court has often overruled its own decisions, and we shall do what we have to do to get it to overrule this one. Second, Lincoln attempted to undermine the Dred Scott opinion's legal authority through a number of ways. He emphasized that the decision had not been unanimous. He claimed that Taney's opinion was the product of, quote, partisan bias by the justices. That it was based on, these are Lincoln's words, assumed historical facts which are not really true, that it was at odds with existing precedent. And because of this, Lincoln insisted the Dred Scott decision was, quote, wanting in public confidence and therefore should be treated as quote not settled doctrine for the country third lincoln maintained that the acquiescence of the people and the states i'm going to repeat that his words the acquiescence of the people and the states was also necessary before constitutional questions could be fully settled he argued that mere precedent from Supreme Court decisions standing alone need not and should not be accepted as definitive until they also had come to be embraced by the American people. Fourth, Lincoln suggested that the Supreme Court's decision could be ignored in good faith by government officials acting to uphold their own constitutional oaths. In support of this position, Lincoln quoted Andrew Jackson. So here's Abraham Lincoln, who many times was denouncing Andrew Jackson, quoting Andrew Jackson in his veto of the bank message. This is Jackson, Lincoln's repeating it. The Congress, the executive, and the court must each for itself be guided by its own interpretation of the Constitution. Every public official who takes an oath to support the Constitution swears that he will support it as he understands it and not as it is understood by others. As Lincoln put it in a subsequent speech, quote, if I were in Congress and a vote should come up on a question whether slavery should be prohibited in a new territory in spite of the Dred Scott decision, I would vote that it could be prohibited. As a fifth and, and final response to the Dred Scott ruling, Lincoln invoked the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution, as the true embodiment of our nation's values. Said Lincoln, I think the authors of that notable instrument, he was talking about the Declaration, not the Constitution, intended to include all men, 
they defined with tolerable distinction in what respects they did consider all men created equal, equal in certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This they said and this they meant. In sum, I would suggest Abraham Lincoln continued to respect the rule of law. He didn't go down a John Brown path of violent rebellion. But at the same time, it's quite interesting, Lincoln did all he could to undercut the legitimacy of the Supreme Court's constitutional ruling in the Dred Scott case. So much like the Sedition Act, this was a long time ago, um, but even though it was a long time ago, it raises a host of fascinating questions that still resonate today. In the spirit of St. John's, I'm gonna pose these questions without attempting to answer them. Quite a luxury, <laughs> quite a luxury, right? Um, so let me start with this. When we as Americans accept Supreme Court decisions that we like based on our political preferences, but then denounce the Supreme Court when the result displeases us, is that right? Are we acting consistent with the rule of law? Here's another question. Given a decision like Dred Scott, what should we, the people, think about the wisdom or the dangers of judicial review? How much faith and reliance do we want to place in the courts to define and interpret the Constitution for us? Another question. If you think about the Dred Scott case, what do we think of Frederick Douglass's remarks? Was he right to keep his faith in the Constitution? Was he right to maintain, even after the Dred Scott decision, that the Constitution rang of liberty and not slavery? And then finally, what are we to make of Abraham Lincoln's concerted efforts to undermine the Dred Scott ruling? What if everyone who disagreed with the Supreme Court decision adopted Lincoln's approach? On the other hand, is Lincoln's approach preferable to direct disobedience or even violent resistance to a judicial decision? So yes, the Sedition Act controversy of the Dred Scott decision. There are events from the distant past. But the more one studies these and many, many other constitutional moments, the more one comes to appreciate that everything eventually comes full circle. The United States history is constitutional history. And that's why I believe that the Constitution is best understood as a storybook that encapsulates our shared American past and it's a storybook that we need to continue to read and teach and study in our classrooms and in our civic society. Thank you for listening.